Thursday was meant to be the day Hugo Chavez was inaugurated for another term as president of Venezuela, but the ceremony has been postponed as he fights cancer. What happens next? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Kimberly Halkett. Thousands of supporters have rallied outside the presidential palace in Caracas to show their support for Hugo Chavez, who is fighting cancer in a Cuban hospital. Well, on Wednesday, Venezuela's Supreme Court ruled his swearing in could be postponed in order to give Chavez time to recover. Well, opposition leader Enrique Capriles has protested the decision, but urged his supporters to stay off the streets. In the meantime, Chavez's anointed successor, Vice President Nicolas Maduro, is running the country. The opposition says this violates the Constitution and Maduro should leave office on Thursday when the current presidential term expires. They argue the leader of the National Assembly, Diosdado Cabello, another Chavez ally, should take temporary charge until new elections can be organized within 30 days. Al Jazeera's Teresa Bo is in Caracas, where she attended a pro-Chavez demonstration. It is difficult to say exactly how many people have come here today, but there are thousands that have come all around the country to show their support and solidarity with President Hugo Chavez. They're carrying his pictures, the Constitution, and saying that now more than ever they are with the President. The National Assembly authorized President Chavez to remain in Cuba indefinitely, and the Supreme Court ruled in favor of postponing the inauguration day until Chavez has recovered. This was supposed to be an inauguration day, but it has turned into a massive show of force of Hugo Chavez's Socialist Party. And people here say that even though he's not in Venezuela, his revolution will continue. The opposition has been demanding for a long time more information on the president's health and when he will return. And until now, they're claiming that the government is not giving enough answers. But people here say that they hope that President Chavez has enough strength to watch the message that they're sending to him today. Well, for more, I'm joined in the studio by Mark Weisbrot, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Juan Carlos Hidalgo, a Latin America policy analyst, is from the Cato Institute. And from St. Louis, Daniel Hellinger is a professor of political science at Webster University and author of a number of books on Venezuela. Daniel, I want to start with you. What do you make it? Maybe you can give us your reaction to the Supreme Court ruling delaying the swearing in of Chavez. Well, I, it, it would be surprising if the Supreme Court had ruled the other way in the first place. Um, but I think it's important for us to get beyond arguing about the constitutionality and the court decision at this point in time. Um, there's wriggle room in the Constitution. It probably could have been interpreted the other way under other political circumstances. But it's pretty clear that after an election that took place in October, after the outpouring of sympathy for Hugo Chavez, that while there's a substantial minority that, uh, that wants the more information or to force an early election, the majority of Venezuelans, I think, at this point in time want to move forward and are kind of content, at least for a while, to let uh, uh, Maduro uh, run the country or at least be the president of the country. There certainly may be that viewpoint uh, you point out inside Venezuela as well as perhaps outside, but some of his political opponents certainly have some issue with the opposition leader Enrique Capriles gave his reaction to the Supreme Court's decision to postpone the inauguration. Let's listen to that. It's regrettable because institutions should not respond to the interests of a party. After all, the fight was over respecting the Constitution, not about a change of government. Be sure of that. I want to be clear on that. Make no mistake, none of these leaders were elected on October 7th. There is one leader from the opposition party, and that's the president of the country, and he was elected on October 7th. Don't confuse things. So, Mark Weisbrot, maybe I can ask you, you know, is this creating deeper political divisions as a result of this ruling? No, I, I think that the Constitution is, is pretty clear. I mean, it says that uh, he, if, he can't, if the president can't do the swearing in on this date uh, in front of the National Assembly, he can do it in front of the Supreme Court, and it doesn't set any date for that. So the court is perfectly clear. Uh, free to, to interpret that as allowing this. 
And there really shouldn't be a problem with this. I think it's only because there's a very strong uh, bias towards the opposition in all of the international media uh, that this is taken seriously. I guess I would compare it to the whole uh, birther movement in the United States where all these people said that... With President Obama's yeah, birth Yeah, he wasn't born there. And, and they, you know, they have their section of the media, and so they convinced uh, 45 to 55 percent of Republicans, according to polling data, believe that's true, and 25 percent overall. Uh, so it's a but, political agenda. But it really saying. wouldn't be taken seriously. And you can see Brazil and all the uh, countries of South America that are there uh, today to show their support for Venezuela. This is just a challenge, you know, it's an opposition uh, trying to uh, take advantage of the situation to uh, undermine the legitimacy of the government, but they don't have a, a constitutional case or a legal basis well, for Carlos, it at all. Do you, do you agree with that? Because uh, Mark did bring up a key point, which many have highlighted, the fact that the, the ruling did not, in fact, uh, specify when Chavez must return to public office. Well, yes, uh, I disagree. Uh, I think the Constitution is clear that a new presidential term starts on January the 10th. The Constitution doesn't say exactly what happens if the president can't show up to his own inauguration. Uh, it is by one of the articles talks about what happens if the president is permanently incapacitated before being sworn in, but it doesn't say not anything about what happens if the presi president is temporarily incapacitated, which is probably this case. Although we don't know the situation with Chavez's health, we don't know if he's alive or or how serious his condition is. We haven't heard from him in a month. Well, so. Uh, what, what, is, what, is, what, what is a fact is that his presidential term, his previous presidential term, expired today. And a new presidential term starts today. And with his presidential term expired, the legitimacy of the people who were serving under him, including Nicolás Maduro. So Nicolás Maduro was the vice president for the previous term, but he cannot continue ruling uh, Venezuela under a new term because he has to be, the president has to be first inaugurated. So, Strictly, if we follow the Venezuelan constitution, although it's not clear what happens in this kind of situation, I will guess that it's the speaker of the National Assembly, the one who will have to assume power temporarily until, I don't know, 90 days, the constitution specifies 90 days to see if the president can uh, return. Th then if in 90 days the president has, haven't recovered, the constitution said that another 90 days can be given. But if by, by that time, the president, president Chavez hasn't returned to Venezuela, a snap election has to be called within 30 days. Well, let's, let's hear but, the reaction from Nicolas Maduro, and then we'll continue this, yeah. this vein of the discussion. Uh, Vice President Maduro welcomed, not surprisingly, the Supreme Court's decision. The president is currently functioning as the republic's president, head of state, and head of government. So at no point in this time has he been absent. On the contrary, it does not even qualify as a temporary absence or a permanent absence. On the contrary, it opens the opportunity for flexibility because the popular will of the people, the general will of the people, is being respected. And it opens the flexibility for the Supreme Court, jointly with the head of state, to coordinate the moment of formally carrying out the inauguration. Well, Mark, you had a point you wanted to bring up Yeah, there. I mean, I, even Juan Carlos is acknowledging that this is a legitimate interpretation by the Supreme Court, and it just, I don't think we really should be even having this discussion. That's what a Supreme Court is for, and they also have a, have a, a, a National Assembly, and so uh, these are where the decisions are made, and I think it probably would have been considered quite outrageous if the Supreme Court has said that he has to step down because he missed his inauguration. But so. it's still a significant milestone. I mean, Daniel, maybe you want to comment on this. Does yeah. it perhaps send a message, though, that, that many of his supporters might even privately fear that Chavez is not fit to govern and new elections need to be held? Um, I don't know that it sends that message, but um, certainly, I mean, uh, my, uh, it's what Venezuelans want that count. But I certainly think that, you know, while the government says we've been forthcoming about his illness and his problems, um, what they haven't said, for example, is exactly what kind of cancer it is. And they're saying, well, respect his privacy. But, it, you know, in reality, it's important for Venezuelans at some point to have some indication of whether what Hugo Chavez's prospects are 
of returning. I guess I would also add that I, I think that both Maduro and Capriles have played, have played their cards very well here. I think Maduro has made the best argument, and it's the one that I was trying to make before, which is let's not argue so much about the Constitution, but look at the question of legitimacy and the legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And Capriles, it's worth pointing out, um, in his statement, while it sounds critical of the, of the government, Capriles also effectively has said, you know, to the uh, to the rest of the opposition, don't come out to the streets, don't don't try to polarize this. And uh, people like there's another opposition figure, Maria, um, oh, Karina Machado, is a very strident ultra opponent of the government uh, who would love to re dial this up into a higher level confrontation. But I think it's significant that Capriles, while being critical, is also, I think, being very smart in sort of asking the opposition to restrain itself. Is this a recognition, Juan Carlos, that, that these are fragile times in Venezuela? Well, not, I mean, for sure. We don't know what's going on with President Chavez and right now. And that's part of the problem. And uh, I, I just would like to imagine what will happen here in the United States if, if President uh, Obama leaves the country for medical treatment and he's nowhere to be found for a month and his inauguration is coming on like January 20th, and he doesn't show up for his own inauguration, what kind of constitutional crisis will have in, in our hands? And, 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 but we have to also uh, distinguish between Venezuela and the United States in those kind of scenarios. We have rule of law in, in, in the United States. We have separation of powers. Not, that's not the case in Venezuela. Except for all, Bush v. Gore. All, the, all of the decisions in Venezuela, <laughs> on Venezuela, all the institutions respond to Chavez. There are actually YouTube videos of the Supreme Court, uh, all the justices of the Supreme Court singing, ooh, ah, Chavez no se va, or ooh, ah, Chavez is not leaving. I mean, imagine that kind of a scenario in, it here in the United States. The question, the so there is no rule of law in Venezuela. Uh, I agree with Daniel when he said that it would, be, it would have been surprising that the Supreme Court will give a, a different, would have given a, a different uh, ruling because we know for a fact that the decision was already made probably in Havana and this, uh, the Supreme Court just uh, stamped it. Well, given that we know so little, well, though, about uh, Mark, about yeah. the um, you know the condition of, of Chavez, what impact would his death or even a resignation at this point have on the stability of the country? I don't think it would have much at all. You know, you hear these theories for years now. You know, and this was a very exaggerated rendition, I think, from Juan Carlos as well. I mean, Venezuela has never had an independent Supreme Court uh, before Chavez, and of course, they don't have one. Uh, that is really independent now, although it has made a number of decisions that went against the government, but it's not as, say, I don't even want to compare to ours because, you know, there were a lot of questions uh, right before the health care decision here about whether our Supreme Court But aren't questions of stability legitimate? No, not really. I mean, they had, you know, look at the run-up to the election. Look at all the news reports you had about how there was going to be violence after the election, you know, and how, and, and it was turned out to be very peaceful. It turned out to be the opposition accepted the result. There was a small uh, faction, just like the extremist faction today, that wanted to cause trouble. It was, it, but uh, it was quite peaceful and quite orderly. And really, you know, I think the opposition is going to hurt itself right now if they, and that's why Capriles told them to stay off the streets because the vast majority of the country not only voted for Chavez, but even more than the ones who voted for him, even, there's even some people in the middle who he are was. sympathetic with the guy who is fighting cancer. And I want to make one more point, you know, for those who keep saying that, well, what's going to happen if this goes on for months or years or whatever they want to exaggerate, you know. The, the Chavez, uh, Chavez and his party have no interest in dragging this out if he's not going to be president. In fact, if he's, not, if he's going to resign, he knows and his party knows that it's best for him to do it soon because the economy grew over 5% this year. They won a landslide victory in, in the election and they're doing quite well. And if they drag it out, it's only going to hurt them. So if he's not, when they know that he's not, if if it turns out that he's not going to recover, he's going to resign. Is the chosen successor, Nicolas Maduro, providing that message, though, that, that things will continue on the same trajectory? I mean, there would have to be elections, of course, but... I just want to kind of clarify that the election went peaceful because the opposition lost. lost. Uh, Chavez said repeatedly during the campaign that there will be a civil war if Capriles won. That's not so actually true. That's, that's true. He, he said, so, he said very specifically, because he does this in every election, he said that we Rangel will respect Silva, the result Rangel no Silva, matter who won. And, and then he asked the opposition to do the same thing. Silva, Rangel that. Silva, Can one I, of the generals uh, of the army, yeah. said that the army wouldn't respect a victory of the opposition, and then he was promoted to Minister well, of Defense can, after can making that statement. Can we come back to the present? Yeah, let's stick to the present and the future too, Daniel. 
I, I think, you know, I, I agree with Mark that in the short run, I don't see problems of stability. I think things will be worked out. I think where things get really interesting is to think what happens if this does drag on, which I agree with Mark that they're, in a lot of ways, the Chavistas have a lot of incentive if Chavez cannot return to have an election as soon as possible. But there are another set of elections coming up. Uh, in May, there are supposed to be municipal elections. Um, I think this is going to be an interesting test. You know, it wasn't, it was only a, within the last week that the Miami Herald uh, reported that Maduro was trying to organize some kind of a rebellion or an opposition candidate to, pro to deny Cabello another term as president of the National Assembly. Well, that never materialized. Um, and and, and it, 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 there's every indication that at least in the short run, Maduro and Cabello are working together. Now, when you look down the road, pretty soon the PSUV, which is the president's party, has got to pick candidates for the next elections. That's where we have to see whether or not the party and Chavismo itself is organized enough and coherent enough to be able to sort of make, in, uh, to, to, to be able to come up with a process that respects the interests of the grassroots chavistas. The people I, I want to just remind our viewers, though, who the some of these these people, these players that we're talking about. For those who don't follow Venezuela uh, as much as, as the three of you yeah, do, sorry about that. no, no, that's fine. This gives me a good opportunity to to bring up this point. And if it is determined that Chavez cannot fulfill his duties, Nicolas Maduro, who we've been talking about, would lead the country and run in the next election as the candidate of the ruling Socialist Party. Now, currently, he is filling in for Chavez right now. Here's his background. Now, he was born in. Caracas in 1962. Maduro worked as a bus driver and served as a leader of his transit union. He has been Chavista since the aftermath of the failed 1992 coup. Maduro met his longtime partner Celia Flores during the, that time and it was then that she was a young lawyer working to get Chavez out of prison. Now she is the attorney general. Now, Maduro became a legislator in 1999 when Chavez assumed the presidency and helped write the new constitution. Maduro served in the National Assembly and became its president, but became known internationally in 2006 when Chavez chose him as foreign minister. He now has served for six years, a sign Chavez has favored him since the communist leader burned through five foreign ministers before Maduro. Now, a recent poll has given Maduro a favorability rating of 59 percent. Maybe, Mark, you can kind of talk about this. I mean, given the fact that there is the possibility of elections, if, if Chavez were to resign, would, how would Maduro fare if he were up in a national election? I think he would very likely win. And this is, again, people, you know, don't necessarily understand this because Venezuela is treated like it's some kind of outlier and you know completely different from the rest of the left governments in Latin America like Brazil and Argentina and Ecuador and, why and Bolivia. Is that? Why is it? Because it has the largest oil reserves in the world and because the United States government has been very hostile uh, to Venezuela since they supported the military coup uh, back in 2002 and there's been a, a lot of uh, there's been know, a lot of concern blood. about its, its and, economy uh, so well that's highly exaggerated too I mean as I said the economy grew by over five percent this year and uh, inflation actually fell while the growth was accelerating so you know and we can argue about the economy all you want you know but the point is that they can, uh, it is very similar. I mean, you look what happened in Brazil. Lula was reelected, and then he campaigned for Dilma, who had never before held public office and uh, elected office, and she was elected. The in, in Argentina, the Cristina Kirchner was reelected by one of the widest margins. You just go through all of them. Evo Morales in Bolivia, uh, uh, Rafael Correa reelected. He's going to be reelected again. Uh, in just a month. And why is that? Because all of these countries have really delivered a very significant increase, improvement in living standards. That's why people voted for Chavez again by a wide margin because the economy grew much faster than it has in decades because they uh, cut unemployment in half, because they cut poverty in half, because they cut extreme poverty by 70 percent, because they uh, tripled access I like, to pensions. I would like to, I would like to talk That's about, why he, about the, the, they'll be reelected even if Chavez okay, doesn't. Well, the economy, the economy has dark clouds in the future. Yes, it grew 5% as, uh, last year because public spending once skyrocketed pre prior to the election. It went up 30% in real terms. And of course, the economy grew out of that. But it's expected to enter in a recession this year. Inflation is expected to once again move to the highest in Latin America. And 
it is expected that the, the, the Bolivar, the currency, will have to be devalued by 50 to 60 percent because it no longer matches the, the, actually the, the finances of the government. This devaluation probably is going to take place after whatever election takes place to replace Chavez. So I agree with Mark in that sense that with Chavez dead, let's say, and under that scenario, on an election call within 30 days of his death, there is a, a very like a strong chance that uh, the Chavista candidate, in this case Maduro, will win under those circumstances. Not only because there is a lot of uh, intimidation, voter intimidation involved. Also, of course, there will be a lot of strong sympathy vote and nostalgic vote for Chavez under those circumstances. And I see Chavismo continuing in, uh, in that scenario. Daniel, where do you see the economy going and also the relationship with the United States, too? Because it seems very much these are often intertwined. <laughs> Well, okay, two things. On the economy itself, I, I mean, I, I, Mark is the economist in the group. Um, I read his reports regularly. I think overall he's right about the, tra the trajectory, but it is an era of high oil prices. Um, they're projected to remain high, but his historically nobody gets oil prices right, not, not the most expert predictors. Do you right think oil so has been one of the factors that's a, a point of tension with the United States and Venezuela? To some degree. I mean, I certainly I think in the long run, U.S. Uh, interests in Venezuela are very much are dictated by oil. It's probably why the United States, as far back as November, we know now, started talking with Maduro about possibly improving relations. That's a positive thing, and it's not something that's just come about in the last month, as you sometimes see in the, in the media. Um, so, so I actually think that, that in a lot of ways, the economy will probably do fairly well. But you know, they've taken out a lot of loans. They've been able to pay a lot of those loans back. I'm talking about the foreign loans. Much of the borrowing is domestic, and that's a whole different matter. Um, but a lot of them come from China and some other countries. So far, so good, Oil, because they're denominated in oil deliveries. If the price of oil falls, then there could be problems. But again, it, you know, for all I know, it could, they could go up again. I think it's such a contingency yeah, uh, I, in terms of talking about real growth in Venezuela. If I could say something about the so economy. Mark, did you want? Yeah, I mean, you know, Juan Carlos is saying what they've been saying, not just him, but everybody who, you know, the business press, everybody who hates uh, Chavez and the government. They've been saying for 12 years that the economy is going to collapse. 12 years. You can just go back, use Nexus, you can read it. And what has happened? They've had only two recessions in Chavez's entire term. One, when the opposition deliberately caused it by shutting down oil production, okay? And, and the second one was in 2009 during the world recession. So, you know, these scenarios are all based on this idea that Chavez, you know, the government's going to run out of foreign exchange, you know. That's the idea that it will cause a recession. And it's not going to happen because we already saw, for example, when, when they actually did need uh, some money, uh, China loaned them $36 billion. And they paid most of it back. Let's finish up on this economic argument, and I really want to finalize, because uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left, on, on the future of the relations between between the United States and Venezuela, Juan Carlos? Well, they're right. not going to change. I don't think they're going to change under, under Maduro. You know, like one of the keystones of left-wing populism in, in, the, in Latin America is anti-Americanism. So whether it's Maduro or whoever else is going to stay in power in Venezuela, when things go wrong, because they will eventually go wrong economically, they will blame the United States. And this has happened before, and it's going to continue happening. So I don't see an improvement in relations uh, uh, in the well, future. Daniel? I'm going to take a different view on that because, first of all, I think that uh, as John Kerry becomes Secretary of State, I think Kerry more than Hillary Clinton has kind of an open mind about Latin America. Um, the second thing, I, I, again, I, I look back to the fact that November already, Under Secretary of State um, uh, Jacobson was, has been talking with Maduro. Now, there are going to be very difficult obstacles to overcome, not the least of which is whether the United States is willing to respect Venezuela's foreign policy towards Iran. I mean, that's a big issue that they're going to have to somehow get past. But Venezuela is a very important country. It has the largest oil reserves in the world. It's a part of a changing Latin America. Um, and the United States is, you know, if we try to isolate Venezuela the way we tried to isolate Cuba, we're going to have very difficult relations with the rest of Latin America as well. And I, I do credit that I think there's signs at least that Obama um, and perhaps Kerry have a longer range view of what's good foreign policy for the United States. I'm not predicting. I mean, at this, <laughs> I keep, I guess I would repeat what I said before. Uh, we're in a, a situation of 
just full of contingencies. I don't think Venezuela is un, uh, unstable, but I think there are tremendous amounts of uncertainties, and that includes what the relations with the United States are going to be in the next year or two. And on that point, I'm going to have to leave it. Gentlemen, do appreciate you joining this discussion. That is all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. I want to remind you to follow us on Twitter as well as Facebook. We can find more on the program. Thanks for watching Inside Story. Thank you.